and 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 that's really all it comes down to. Yeah, and it's it's funny that you mentioned about the the spending because I actually just saw a poll recently that they they asked um, just American citizens what they ranked highest as as where government spending could be cut most and. Across the board, the the highest thing was foreign aid, which makes up something like like 0.5 or 1 percent of of the of the budget each year, as as opposed to the the hundreds of billions and even trillions of dollars that, that we spend on on entitlement programs. And I, I don't think uh, unless we handle those, I don't think there's there's any way to to put us on on a path to long term sustainability. Well, that's correct. But 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 more than that, for some reason, when you talk about entitlement programs. Uh, many people, both on the right and the left, for some reason or another, focus almost exclusively on Social Security, which is which is really not a, a, a problem. It could, it could be fixed relatively easily. The the 800-pound gorilla in the room is Medicare, and 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 even people on the right are afraid to to go after that. Uh, last year, uh, for example, when uh, uh, Obama proposed cutting Medicare uh, 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 to pay for uh, expanded coverage for the uninsured, uh, the Republican Party ran advertisements saying we must not cut Medicare for any reason. Uh, I mean, they're just pandering to, to the elderly, uh, to be sure, uh, but I think that they've uh, dug themselves into a hole here uh, that is going to be very hard to get out. And so, again, I keep saying, you know, where are we going to find the, the votes to enact these massive spending cuts that all these Tea Party people seem to uh, favor, but they never actually name a specific program other than, like you say, foreign aid uh, that, that they're actually willing to support cuts in. And uh, we need to do many, many times more than you can get out of cutting foreign aid to deal with our fiscal problems. So how do you think the, the rise of these anti-tax groups like the Tea Party and, and the recently dogmatic no-tax position of the Republican Party, how, how does that affect our ability to implement tax reform? Well, it makes it very hard, very, very hard indeed. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that what we have right at the moment, uh, unfortunately, is just political paralysis, and that means our fiscal problems are simply going to fester to the point where they have meaningful economic effects on the country, uh, and that means uh, probably we're going to get back to something like a, a stagflation situation such as we had in the 1970s uh, where we have high inflation and high interest rates, and at that point, uh, people will become uh, desperate uh, to cut uh, the deficit, and, uh, and, and the political support will finally be there. Uh, to do things that uh, I think are politically impossible today. Do you think we'll need a, a Volcker-type figure that's kind of insulated from uh, the political cycle to, to do that for us? No, absolutely not. Uh, I think that this uh, Budget Commission is just, you know, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's, 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 it's just one of those steps we have to take uh, to to get it out of the way so, uh, before we reach the point that we realize that we have to do it the old-fashioned way. The president's going to have to take some leadership. Uh, we're going to have to have some negotiations with members of, of, of Congress. And and unfortunately, the, the history of these things is that they never do enough uh, the first time. They always have to go back and do it again and again and again. Uh, before they finally uh, deal with uh, get the problem down to a manageable level, uh, so it's uh, it, it, you know it's I feel like I'm watching history being replayed, uh, my own life's history being replayed in front of me. But I don't. But unfortunately, there are too few people around who remember that history, and uh, uh, so they have to to you know go through the motions all over again. Now, now, given the stance of, of the Republican Party facing these issues, do you, would you say that, that, that the Republicans have become ideologically bankrupt? Well, they're, they're intellectually bankrupt, I would agree with that. I'm not so sure how ideological they really are. Uh, I think they're simply pandering uh, to, to any group in society that is, uh, has some disagreement with the government or with uh, the administration uh, uh, about anything. Uh, and, and what they've <coughs> carefully done is to uh, uh, stoke uh, those disagreements without offering any alternatives. 
uh, because they know that if they put any kind of alternative on the table, then people could evaluate the two options, and they might very well decide that the Republican option is stupid. So they just say nothing other than, Obama's wrong, Obama's a socialist, he's destroying the country, elect us. That's it. That's, that's the, the sum total of their program. And, uh, and the Tea Party people are very much in the same uh, mindset. They're, they're against everything that the administration is doing, but they're not in favor of anything that is even remotely, I mean, I don't even know what they're in favor of other than we just, you know, I want to put more money into my own pocket from tax cuts, but I don't actually want to pay for anything, the, the spending that I benefit from. And, you know, you see these stories about some of the leading Tea Party people are, you know, receiving millions of dollars in ag subsidies and things of this sort. Uh, those are, I, I suspect they don't want those programs cut. But look, I mean, it's, it's human nature to be selfish and to look at the world through, you know, your own eyes and, it, uh, believe that what's good for you is good for everybody else, uh, and it's the job of, of, of leaders to try to uh, explain <coughs> the, the, the reality of the situation. And I think uh, our leaders have let us down, uh, and, and, and not by not explaining things very clearly and it, walking them through the logic of, of why certain policies were done. And I also think some mistakes were made. Uh, so. You know, it's just part of the democratic process, and I don't know what what else we can do about it because the alternatives are worse. So, what do you think the uh, what do you think that means for our two party system that we don't really have a a, a very strong or, or or genuine even party of the right that that we only have the the, the party of some would say bad ideas and then the the party of no ideas. Where do we go from here? Oh yeah, the uh, I mean historically, uh, you know, the two parties have been divided between one is the evil party and the other is the stupid party, and uh, you know it changes from back and back and forth from time to time. Uh, but uh, I, I think the real problem is, is 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 we need some sort of political reform in the Senate uh, in particular. I just think it's irresponsible for the Republicans to just filibuster every single thing, no matter how trivial. Uh, because it's just going to come back and bite them on the ass uh, unless they think that there's never going to be another Republican president. And if they think, uh, or, or if they think that when that day comes, they will have more than 60 votes in the Senate, uh, they're going to be, they're going to eventually suffer from the exact same policies that they are uh, pursuing themselves. And I think that's a very uh, penny wise, pound foolish attitude. Uh, I have no problem with the, with them filibustering things from time to time, but I just think this idea that every single thing needs 60 votes in the Senate is, is ridiculous. And I think that's the real problem that we have today that's unique in our history. Uh, the filibuster has never, ever been used so trivially. Uh, it's always been reserved for uh, issues of, of special importance. Okay, and you've arisen as as one of the really rare sort of nonpartisan voices in the media on economic affairs. Uh, given the that economics is supposed to be a, a science, if you will, what do you think accounts for the hyperpartisan nature of of the economic commentary and analysis in the media these days? I think, I honestly think that a lot of it has to do with cable news. Uh, it it fosters a a a, a a silly sort of debate uh, format, and uh, and I think people go on these shows, they listen to these shows, and they get this idea that that the world that everything is black and white, and and I know I've stopped doing cable news and I stopped watching it a couple of years ago, and I think that's really helped me a lot in terms of keeping my sanity, 